we'll just click into Yeah, just put heroes back up like that. So once again, sorry I'm late. I uh, hope to go, well, I will go back and watch those presentations. I'm sure they were wonderful. Um, and I really like what, I already forgot the name, but um, I, can really, sorry. I really like what Mason did with the last presentation, providing a bit of background on um, himself as a person. So I wasn't planning on it, but yeah. I'm going to start there, actually. I think that's a great place to start. So um, my name is Sage Fox, and I graduated from Oregon State University, just my bachelor's in 2020. I studied uh, fisheries and wildlife science. In the process, I worked every summer for Idaho Fishing Game, doing uh, mostly some on its snorkel surveys in Idaho. So we snorkeled on creeks and uh, basically survey endangered species of salmon and steelhead by physically counting them, um, just visual encounter surveys. I also worked with a professor at Oregon State named Yvonne Arzmendi, who was from Chile, specifically the Cartimont area. And uh, he was never actually my professor, and I didn't. Um, do a lot of research with him. We hit it off and talked all through college about uh, his research in Chile and uh, just about Chile in general, which is what initially sparked my interest in coming down here. Um, what struck me at first talking to Yvonne was, uh, well, one, how similar Chile sounded to Oregon, in his words. Um, he moved to Oregon, I think, about 20-some years ago, and uh, he never moved back because he liked it. He said it it was fairly similar. Um, and he informed me early on in college of something I didn't know, which is that Chile has salmon and steelhead, and uh, lots of them, and huge ones. Um, and so that was, at this point, almost six years ago. Um, since then, I've become more and more interested in the topic of why are salmon and steelhead in Chile? How are they successful? Um, why are they commercially important? Um, and what does this mean for Chile? because I spent a lot of my life being aware of salmon and steelhead issues in the Pacific Northwest, where they're an endangered species and they have an entirely different ecological context. So I got to talking more and more with Yvonne, and eventually um, he introduced me to a colleague of his, Dr. Jorge Eduardo Leon Munoz, who I'll introduce a little later in the slides, don't have a picture for him. Um, and uh, Dr. Munoz works at uh, uh, UCSC, it's the Catholic University in Concepcion, I always butcher the name. Um, and uh, when I met with him, he told me that all of his research is focused on salmon and steelhead, drought, um, and uh, big picture, picture issues like how um, climate change and forestry affects um, fisheries and aquaculture in Chile. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and so that's what, over the course of three or so years, brought me down here. More interested in salmon still in Chile. So, um, I already talked about this a little bit, but I'll go straight into the context for salmon still in Chile. There are seven species of Pacific salmon, and five of those are from North America. Of those, um, I believe actually all of them have been at one point or another uh, attempted to be introduced into Chile, um, some more successfully than others. There are four of them that, uh, well, four or five, five, that have taken hold to some degree in Chile. Um, and of them, two are really dominant, and those are Chinook salmon and rainbow trout. So um, throughout northern Patagonia, from around the Puerto Mont area, the Relonca de Fjord, all the way down to uh, Tierra del Fuego, salmon and steelhead now reproduce on their own, um, they come back in huge numbers, kind of like in Alaska, kind of like we imagine the Old West um, of North America. And, uh, and they're huge. And people around the world fly from you know, rich countries down to Chile to fly fish for these huge salmon steelhead. Um, brown trout and brook trout, um, cherry salmon, all of those also exist in Chile. I'm a little less interested in them just because they're less ecologically impactful, worth less money. So that's about all I'll say about them. Um, beyond that, Chinook salmon and rainbow trout uh, were or are still being used for a very lucrative aquaculture industry here in Chile. So many of them were introduced for recreational reasons, at least to the rivers. Um, there was controversy for a long time over whether they escaped from hatcheries. 
and then colonize the rivers, whether people actually introduced them deliberately. Uh, the consensus is, at this point is that um, they were introduced deliberately, but also used for aquaculture, because they do great here. And so aquaculture in Chile is a huge industry. Chile is the uh, second largest producer of salmon and steelhead, mostly Chinook salmon, um, in the world right now. I believe the first, don't quote me on this, is, uh, well, it's one of the northern European countries. I think it's Norway, right? That sounds right. <laughs> I was going to say Norway or Sweden, I didn't remember which. Um, so Chile is a huge producer of this. This is a lucrative industry and a rapidly expanding one, too. Um, we'll look at a map. Well, no, it's already here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I threw this together, so apologies if it's uh, disorganized. But um, at this point in time, there's a later map that shows hatcheries for salmon steelhead. This is showing native distributions. So this was uh, back when salmon and steelhead were initially introduced. This is only talking about Chinook salmon. But they were introduced in this region at first and started to take off. And then they just slowly moved southward over time. At this point, salmon and steelhead are found throughout the entire length of uh, southern Chile. Um, but what I was, was going to say is that salmon and uh, steelhead farms are also found everywhere. I mean, even more densely clustered than um, these identified native populations of salmon, of salmon and steelhead. So I still haven't really gotten into why this matters. Um, what I found interesting about this is that salmon and steelhead in the Pacific Northwest, they're endangered species. They're sort of a don't touch them, you know, don't hurt them, um, $2,000 fine if you kill the wrong one. Like, they're, they're a sensitive subject. People fight over them all the time. Uh, there are a lot of debates and conversations over things like the Columbia River dams, the fishery out of um, you know, Puget Sound, all of that. Um, and in Chile, the context is just completely different. It's uh, almost the reverse. Salmon and steelhead are a prized, introduced species um, that people love, many people love. Um, they're also invasive. They uh, are taking off. A lot of these populations weren't actually introduced initially. They just spread from existing populations. They're an apex predator in the streams they inhabit. So um, what's talked about less is that, yes, they do consume smaller fish and vertebrates. And we don't even really know exactly which fish and invertebrates. Um, they also migrate way up rivers and then die, which means they're leaving huge amounts of uh, marine nitrogen and other marine nutrients inland, um, which is something that is critically important in the Pacific Northwest, Canada, um, and Alaska for sustaining rich rainforest ecosystems, but something that has no uh, evolutionary context here. Um, and so, at the very least, it's a change. Um, Beyond that, I was interested in the theoretical implications of salmon and steelhead in Chile. The fact that salmon are, or let me back up. Um, in North America, salmon and steelhead um, have been studied exhaustively at this point. Um, we spent a lot of money on it. In Chile, um, they're inhabiting basically streams and rivers that didn't previously have them. And so we have kind of a clean slate for uh, invasion biology, for looking at how salmon and steelhead would be colonized in the say, in Mexico. Um, I even think this has relevance for um, dam removal projects. So um, in the Pacific Northwest, as we remove dams to start to reintroduce salmon and steelhead, it might be interesting to, um, to look at Chile and say, OK, this is what they do when they're given a fresh new river. This is how they colonize it. We haven't really gotten to see that before. The last time that happened on a large scale in North America was, uh, well, I mean, during mass geological um, weather events. Uh, mm. After I say that, uh, but that was a long time ago. Um, the last piece here is tied to drought. Um, that's a little unrelatable. It'll come in later. That's more related to um, uh, funding for equipment than anything. Um, so I already touched on this, but. Um, there's a lot we don't know about salmon and steelhead in Chile. Um, we more or less know they're spread throughout the country, um, but there aren't really population estimates. A lot of people don't know which rivers they're in or which species are in which, which rivers. Generally, about all we know at this time, at least in the published literature, is that salmon and steelhead, particularly Chinook salmon and um, rainbow trout steelhead, are 
uh, more or less found throughout Chile, but we don't know which rivers they prefer, which ones they're not in, how far up the rivers they go, when they go into the rivers even. A lot of these things are known by fishermen, but um, haven't been formally documented. And then beyond that, um, we don't know whether their habitat selection or choices of rivers differs from North America. We don't know how this compares to North America. And I think that ties back to this being a, an interesting case study and experiment for North American salmon. Um, I already showed you, um, well, this obviously is southern Chile. Um, salmon steel are found throughout the region. But the part that we are particularly interested in is this northern area. This is where salmon and steelhead were initially introduced and where they've had the most time to develop. Um, in particular, tributaries of the, the Relunkavi Fjord, which um, I cut off a little bit, it's up there. Um, those tributaries have thriving and sustaining populations of shook salmon, steelhead, and other salmonids. And, uh, we're interested in seeing how they interact and what they're doing on a finer scale within that watershed. Um, so, uh, what's the plan? The plan is still being defined at this point because there's a lot of equipment um, and personnel involved. But generally speaking, my goal coming here was to assist with mapping out distributions of sand and steel and other sand lines on a finer scale while also collecting other environmental data that hasn't been collected alongside salmon and steelhead presence absence data at the same time at least. So that means collecting flow measurements, uh, temperature readings, um, water quality readings. Um, data that exists on Chilean rivers but hasn't been collected in the same snapshot as yes we know this about the river and there are salmon here. What does that tell us? Um, nine months is a pretty short time to uh, actually carry out a thorough field sampling and analyze the data. And so that's actually the tricky part that I've been struggling with for, for the past few months is figuring out what is the most effective use of the nine months. Because unlike some of you here, this isn't a project that is tied to a PhD I've started. Um, and I still haven't figured out how to tie it to a master's afterwards necessarily. And so it's a little open-ended where I'll be able to go with this. Um, but at the very least, my goal is to um, contribute as much as I possibly can towards ongoing efforts to surveying um, and also studying the implications of sand and steelhead's presence in the region. Um, since I'm probably running out of time, I'll tie this to the drought really quick. Uh, where the drought, com drought uh, research comes in is related to the collaborators. Um, so Dr. Jorge Leon Munoz, um, the person I'll be working with most closely, his research is much broader than salmon and steelhead. In fact, that is somewhat of a minor subset of his research. That's how I got to know him, because he works with the professor at OSU, who specializes in that. But he's more interested in uh, watershed, landscape scale changes, and how salmon and steelhead play into that. Um, and recently, he secured a large amount of funding for um, basically drought research and uh, looking at resilience of Chilean rivers to drought and also trying to categorize them based on um, priority for conservation, priority for water management, based on their ecological and economic value. And that's where salmon and steelhead tie in. They're part of that economic value and actually part of that ecological value. Um, whether they're the ones that we care about or the ones they're eating, they matter. Um, and so this is something that is uh, getting really interesting, something I'm working on right now actually, because I recently found out about these two um, sources of funding that Dr. Munoz received. Um, they support the actual equipment, teams, collaborators. Um, these are big grants and these will be uh, ongoing huge projects to study droughts in the region. We're trying to tie the salmon and steel steelhead topic into that. Um, what that might look like is something I'm still working on defining. It most likely will involve collecting flow data and data like that alongside these presence absence um, data and then hopefully trying to get an idea of okay what are low flows doing to salmon in the region and why does that matter and we'll see how far I get with it.